encourage our orthopedic surgeon regarding the diagnosis and treatment planning of their patient so our next planning going to be speaker stock our uh, today's our speaker his talk is on basic to advanced shoulder examination আচ্ছা মাসুদ স্যার আনমিউট করতে হবে আপনার হ্যালো I will talk on shoulder history taking basics to advance. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, Go on. So uh, this is Professor Yang Galdi from South Korea. He is my mentor. I, along with Dr. Parvez Asan and Dr. Jangi, took training on shoulder arthroscopy from him. So shoulder. Shoulder is a complex joint. And if you take good history, take, uh, good history, then the life will be easy. So it is key to uh, um, uh, accurate diagnosis. And if you take the good history, it will channel your clinical examination pathway. That means if you suspect, hello. Okay. Correct. Yes. 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 Please move this window away from the show. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I can't guess, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. সবাইকে Okay. Can everyone see the yeah, screen? Yeah, we can see. We can see. We see okay. your shared. Yeah, yeah, we can see, sir. Continue. 
मेटिकुलसली It will uh, help you in decision making, and this is the anatomy of shoulder. I will not repeat. Different clinical conditions such as the various impingement syndromes, rotator cuff tears like partial and complete, calcific tendinitis, adhesive capsulitis, and nerve entrapment syndrome have similar histories, pain patterns, and findings on physical examination. So I will last now discuss. about uh, the various aspects of the history so that after the lecture the history taking possibly will be easier to you now when a patient comes to you think his age and what are the common conditions in his age if the patient is below 30 think about instability and traumatic lesions if it is, he is about 30 to 60 think about impingement syndrome Calf tear, frozen shoulder, and if he's above sixty, think about arthritis. But this is, but in mind these things, and avascular necrosis, infections, and rheumatoid arthritis can occur at any age. And six, most pathologic processes that afflict the shoulder know no gender boundaries, but the multi-directional shoulder instability. is seen many times more often in young female patients between the ages of 15 and 25 years than in male patients of the same age female patients also tend to present in far greater numbers than males with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder although massive rotator cuff tears possibly occur in greater numbers in men it is the women classically older than 70 years who develop the sequelae of these massive rotator cuff tears and this is the uh, simple chart of history and examination of the shoulder and this is the anatomy and now history taking when you take the history start with open ended question and what is open ended question and interview question that encourages an answer phrased in respondents own words and what is closed ended question an interview question that asks the respondent to make a selection from a limited list of responses so please start with open ended question last just like how does your arm bother you he will say about pain in shoulder or shoulder feels stiff or there is reduced movement he may say about the instability like sleeps the shoulder goes out or gives way and also you have to recognize the pattern and main shoulder symptoms are pain pain and stiffness and feeling of instability and ask about the onset of pain like whether it is traumatic traumatic may be due to labral tears cuff tears fracture or dislocation and there may be a traumatic cause like soft tissue inflammatory condition frozen shoulder bursitis or calcifications arthritis or infections so ask about the nature of pain severe pain at rest this may uh, just uh, you make you think that it may be frozen shoulder infection or inflammation if there is constant dull pain this may be due to bursitis neurological pain night pain in infection and also cuff pain and sometimes in also in frozen shoulder an intermittent sharp pain like in impingement and see the picture if he shows the pain at the top of the shoulder it may be due to acromioclavicular osteoarthritis if he make a if show a uh, horseshoe shaped area uh, just on the lateral side of the tip of the shoulder then it may be due to rotator cuff tear if he point his uh, uh, the finger in the uh, attachment of the uh, deltoid muscle it may be due to uh, just frozen shoulder and if he show 
its finger pointing an anterior of the shoulder, it may be bicipital tendinitis or maybe due to glenoid uh, pathology. And don't be in a hurry. For example, if a patient presents complaining of an inability to elevate or externally rotate the arm, the physician might immediately diagnose the shoulder and shoulder. And see, uh, in many cases, especially in GPs and also in case of orthopedic surgeons, many uh, uh, doctors uh, just diagnose as frozen shoulder and sending that patient who really has advanced osteoarthritis yeah, to physical yeah. therapy to increase the range of motion. Yeah. But if you send this patient of osteoarthritis to physical therapy, he may have more pain or aggravating the pain. So ensues the therapeutic failure. So frozen shoulder, be aware of it. Always it is not frozen shoulder. So from the history, you may differentiate frozen shoulder from other, but in clinical examination, will be confirmed whether it is frozen shoulder, frozen shoulder, or uh, not frozen shoulder. So please mute, please mute. No, sir, mute it. Please mute others. Mute others. Okay, uh, so in Portman, uh, he uh, told in 1943, this entity, frozen shoulder is difficult to define, difficult to treat, and difficult to explain from the point of view of pathology. In 1992, American shoulder and elbow surgeons make a conscious, consensus, a condition of uncertain etiology characterized by significant restriction of both active and passive shoulder motion that occurs in the absence of a known shoulder disorder. And so exclude always the calf tendinopathy or tendinosis where you suspect it is a frozen shoulder. Because in my practice, I saw that 70% uh, uh, patient, Noshad, uh, please unmute others. Uh, please, uh, okay. So exclude uh, calf tendinopathy or tendinosis. Because uh, to in my frozen shoulder. So, which is adult anti inflammatory drugs, quality of life is hampered. And duration, what is the duration of frozen shoulder? Andrew Roy in 2002 has told that an episode of unilateral frozen shoulder may well mean a prolonged abscess for one, three years. And what are the stages of frozen shoulder, like feeling phase, pain and loss of movement for about three months, frozen phase, and also the thawing phase, which is from nine to 18 months. There may be less pain in this period. So is the recovery uh, you also ask the patient in history that what is his total duration 30 percent of the that is still and also So think of the, the bilateral frozen shoulder which you suspect, but always this is not frozen shoulder. Bilateral could be uh, due to cervical spine compression. When it is central compression, the, it may uh, give history like the frozen shoulder. And tumor and calcific tendon always consider this because pain and here the pain and disability is. to symptom and ask about the duration constant pains pain on all movement long duration it may be the arthritis and short duration it may be a frozen shoulder calcific tendinitis infection and bursitis but in case of frozen shoulder it may be lengthened and ask about the relieving or uh, aggravating just intermittent pain overhead activities are uh, restricted mild range uh, abduction and internal rotation, pain only on certain movements, no pain in neutral abduction, impingement or calf dysfunction is the diagnosis. 
and if he say that he uh, he can uh, do the hyper abduction on it pains when lying on side it may be lead to a joint arthritis and thing about the red flag symptoms red flag symptoms also you know in spine there are certain red flag symptoms what are that the systemic symptoms like fever weight loss or mass or swelling if fever this may be due to the arthritis septic arthritis or maybe due to tumor this if there is weight loss or mass or swelling uh, uh, significant weight loss this may be due to tumor so uh, um, exclude about the history in history also the malignancy trauma or recent convulsion night pain or constant pain change in shoulder contour with loss of rotation uh, it may, may be uh, helpful in examination also the significant and sensory and motor deficit suggest a neural degeneration uh, associated symptoms there may be arm weakness like neurological you uh, ask about the tingling numbness and radiation to tip of fingers it may be due to neck origin a brachial neuritis or nerve root compression and ask about instability or laxity laxity is a just uh, you can uh, elicit it during your examination and what is instability instability is the symptomatic laxity excessive translation that causes symptoms in conscious patients it is uh, just told in 2009 by pascal bolio uh, the spectrum is painful subluxations to dislocations and it may be due to traumatic or non traumatic causes so instability if due to traumatic you ask when that means when was the first dislocation how does the mechanism fit with the type of dislocation and where and also the post injury events they just ask whether it was reduced by self or reduced at a hospital the x ray evidence if uh, he is with him and uh, it was it by anesthesia or by uh, just uh, pulling uh, and just the, doing the maneuver and the rehabilitation ask about the rehabilitation process with sling and the duration because if you rehabilitate or uh, keep the sling prolonged there may be stiffness and about the recur recurrent dislocation always ask about the number of previous dislocation ease of dislocations and also ease of relocations and position of the arm when dislocation occurred because you have to adjust uh, from the history you have to talk a diagnosis and also the treatment plan and due to uh, your for decision making the possibility of needing bony procedure or not you have to ask about the high ener high energy injury whether the shoulder instability occurs in mid range of abduction or not patient notes the progressive a case of instability uh, and factors affecting the decision making like the arm dominance whether it is right or left hand what, what is his occupation and what is his recreation procedure and the general health fitness for surgery and and the instability severity index it you have to just ask it and uh, fill a form so that you can take the diagnosis which procedure of surgery will go going to adopt and conclusion of the analysis if the score is three or less uh, recurrence rate of the 5% arthroscopic stabilization and if the score is more than six you will be considering the bony block procedure and injuries associated with acute shoulder dislocation you will ask about the vascular injuries nerve injuries and you have to exclude the rotator cuff tears during your physical examination and factors affecting the decision making or prognosis personal history activities of daily living affected eating personal laying or wearing clothes cooking etc whether it is affected or not how work or recreation affected treatment you ask about the treatment history whether uh, he was injected with steroid injection their benefit and duration and the past medical history like diabetes hypothyroid and other comorbidities and so uh, at last you can uh, just talk a diagnosis at uh, below the age of 30 
age of the, the 30 to 60 and above 60, which I mentioned before. And so painful shoulder, if it is intermittent, this may be due to calf pathology. If it is constant due to bursitis and painful and stiff shoulder, this may be due to frozen shoulder, glenohumeral arthritis, or post-traumatic CPD. So, so all the times you wear it in mind. Thank you. Please stop sharing your screen. Yes. Uh, excellent presentation from Dr. Hassan Masood. He covers the all aspects of the shoulder, which are encouraging us to how to examine, how to take history and planning for the treatment of the disease. Thanks, Dr. Hassan Masood. Our next presenter, I myself. Um, now I am going to share my screen. Thank you, sir. Yes. What about question and answer? Uh, question and answer, it will be discussed later on. Yes. Okay. Okay, sir. Again, good evening, dear colleagues. We are clinician, not the radiologist, but we have to know normal anatomy and its variants and signs of abnormal pathology of the shoulder. This will help us regarding our patient diagnosis and treatment planning. I hope all will enjoy the basic uh, MRI of shoulder, which will help us in our next practice area. I am Dr. GM Jangirashan, presently at working at Mitur, Dhaka. And my now I'm going to my topic. How do I know MRI of shoulder? Everybody should know that is three sequence or plan of the shoulder MI. You can see this is coronal oblique, it is sagittal oblique, and axial view. Why it is coronal oblique, why it is sagittal oblique, we will discuss later on. So to see the picture or MRI, you always remember this is coronal oblique, this is sagittal oblique, and this is axial cut. Coronal oblique because it is always parallel to the supraspinatus muscle. So supraspinatus muscle is not to the true coronal plan. Thus, it is oblique. This is why this is cut. It's coronal oblique. Through this cut, the coronal oblique, we can see supraspinatus tendon. It is supraspinatus tendon, AC joint, superior inferior labrum and this is biceps tendon and also you can see the uh, sub uh, acromion and sub deltoid bursa. Always you remember this is coronal oblique and this is normal anatomy of the coronal oblique MRI of shoulder. And there are main three cuts of coronal oblique. It is through the anterior, middle and posterior. Anterior, we can see that is deltoid muscles. That is uh, clavicle. This is acromion. This is supraspinatus muscle. This is coracoid. This is subscapularis muscle. This is infraspinatus and teres minor. And more middle cut. This is very important for us. You can see all right, this is coronal oblique plane. When deltoid is this is vertical one, and uh, supraspinatus is. Uh, uh, Horizontal, this is coronal oblique plan. And you can see the glenoid, this is superior uh, labrum, inferior labrum, there is subscapularis muscle, that is infraspinatus muscle, this is ter uh, teres minor. And this coronal oblique cut through the posterior of the shoulder, and you can see and trapezius muscle, this is spine of the scapula, this is some sort of supraspinatus. That is infraspinatus, teres minor. This is not required. This is the uh, medial head of the tricep. You can see. 
and next is sagittal oblique this cut is perpendicular to the plane of supraspinatus muscle and it is parallel to the glenohumeral joint in this view always remember this is sagittal oblique view it is this one medial side and this is lateral side from this image we can see mostly rotator cuff insertion mainly that is supraspinatus that is infraspinatus tendon and this is teres minor tendon this one teres muscles it is supraspinatus tendon uh, and in the medial side this is subscapularis tendon in between supraspinatus inter this is hair that is bicep and you can so and from this image you can see very important one that is acromion and from this sagittal oblique view you can identify various types of acromion and in this slide you can see that is uh, that is four variety of acromion this is flat type 1 acromion there is cut type 2 there is hook variety of acromion type 3 and this is convex four variety of acromion all these except the one for this impingement to the our uh, rotator cuff mainly supraspinatus muscle an axial cut always you remember this view this is axial cut axial cut from axial cut we can see anterior posterior labrum uh, glenohumeral ligament bicep tendon and subscapular teres minor and this cut this is humeral head and this is glenoid always remember this one is supraspinatus nos and it is always posterior so this is anterior and this is posterior and anterior side what are structure also we can know the anterior part this is bicipital group who is the bicep tendon tackle down and this is subscapular tendon and this is uh, this is bursa uh, under the subscapular muscles and this is the medial glenohumeral ligament and always this is anterior labrum this was posterior labrum and this is a uh, subscapular tendon and subscapular muscle in presbyterus muscle as well as teres minor muscle and this remember this is axial cut mostly axial cut we can see anterior and posterior labrum this is posterior labrum until i again mention you that if type of uh, uh, glenoid seen to you this is posterior this is anterior because this is supra uh, scapular nos supra supra scapular nos and now we come to this labrum <coughs> labrum mostly triangular in cross section and always it is low signal in intensity that is dark in color that like is meniscus of the knee i think here is more knee surgeon in this session so if you so always uh, labrum is triangular superior labrum and inferior labrum always it is triangular in section and always low signal intensity that is uh, dark in coronal oblique view you can see that is superior labrum inferior labrum all are normal labrum also this is supraspinatus muscle which is deltoid this is subscapularis that is infraspinatus and this is ac joint now we can see that is normal anterior posterior labrum this is what type of cut exactly that is posterior supraspinatus nos so this is posterior and this is side anterior that is anterior labrum this is posterior labrum and this is the subscapularis tendon muscle and this is bicipital uh, group here bicep tendon sometimes is located here this is normal anterior labrum posterior labrum we can see axial cut we mostly Uh, labral injury from the axial cut you can see so superior labrum i have mentioned above uh, previously and there are superior labrum by slap lesion it is sometimes also associated with normal variation that is you can see this is coronal oblique view is superior labrum that is normal normal triangular it is low signal intensity this is supraspinatus muscle good muscle good uh, maybe bulky muscle in this cut of uh, there is abnormality in the hair superior labrum is normal but there is 
some sort of abnormality there when a high signal that means high signal intensity it indicates that is superior labrum is uh, abnormal that is superior labral tear and here inferior labrum is okay in this variety you can see there is also uh, high signal intensity in the superior labrum uh, so it may be some abnormality but we can see it, it is anatomic variation that is subcortical reaches how we differentiate you can see this image in this uh, high signal intensity it is irregular and larger than this, this uh, high signal intensity it is a smooth margin it is irregular margin and the, the it is pathology that is more than 3 mm but where is sub labral reaches normal canavanum it is less than 3 mm remember this is also um, mri arthrography you can see that is axillary pause as it accumulate the drive so uh, this is uh, superior labral tear slab lesion superior labral anterior posterior tear and uh, this is sub labral reaches sometimes we are confused with this and this correction should be done with another slide that is axial cut so we are very commonly face shoulder dislocation at the first time dislocation or recurrent dislocation patient come to us with we everybody say it is bankard lesion and now we can see what is bankard lesion i have mentioned previously that is always we can uh, clearly see the labral that is bankard lesion by the axial cut this is posterior this is anterior that is both posterior labrum and anterior labrum okay fine there is no abnormal changes here in this cut we can see there is a changes both in uh, anterior labrum and posterior labrum so we can see there is bankard lesion anterior bankard lesion posterior bankard lesion this is abnormal changes in and here also that is change this is bicipital group but there is a a uh, high signal intensity so some sorts of tear of the subscapularis as well as bicep you can see this uh, figure that is this one posterior labrum this is anterior labrum and there is changes in the anterior labrum so see so it is bankard lesion again this is bicipital uh, group and bicep some sorts of by edema or uh, bicep tendinitis there that is a bicep lesion. also in this case also there are abnormal changes both anterior and posterior labrum so this is both anterior posterior bankard lesion remember all of these axial cut we can see the bankard lesion uh, clearly and this is easy and now we can see this slide the alpha lesion that is anterior labral peristeal slip avulsion it is very common when patient come to us with recurrent dislocation when we do the arthroscopy there is no labrum you know this is tackled down with the peristeum of the glenoid medially the so tackle down here you can see that is uh, anterior labrum this is inferior glenohumeral ligament all are uh, shifted from the glenoid margin medially towards the glenoid neck that is it is alpha lesion and this is axial cut and also this is this view is it is it is a coronal oblique view also this is coronal oblique we can see that is inferior labrum and <coughs> labrum torn and it is uh, detached medially with the peristeum of uh, the glenoid the alpha lesion this is anterior this is inferior antero inferior uh, labral injury so alpha lesion bankard lesion as well as the alpha lesion in this view you can see that is this is ct scan ct scan here is a uh, anterior bankard this is posterior that is anterior anterior bankard bony bankard lesion in case ct and in case of mr uh, mr image you can see uh, this is the bony bankard lesion easily this is uh, mr arthrography with the, the dye uh, injected and uh, taken the mri images this is arthrography mr arthrography is this bony bankard lesion uh, actually bony bankard or hill sack it, it can be more easily seen by ct scan uh, more it is can be detected by 3d ct a hill sack lesion now it is associated with recurrent shoulder dislocation or it may be first time traumatic dislocation 60 to 75 percent bankard lesion are present you can see that this is bankard lesion uh, this is 
uh, humeral head, this is glenoid. That is posterior, this is anterior. So this one, posterolateral or posterolateral part of the humeral head, that is defect. We can see it in hill sex lesion. It is a deep hill sex lesion. Sometimes it is engaging or engaging type. You can see here, that is posterior, this is anterior, the labral chair, and also the bony, uh, sorry, hill sex lesion, which is about uh, 23.5 millimeter and 6.3 uh, breadth, large hill sex lesion. And these are the engaging and non engaging hill sex lesion. This is also a uh, coronal oblique view. So we can see uh, hill sex lesion that is axial cut, coronal oblique cut clearly. This is large hill sex lesion associated with inferior uh, labral gear that is back cut lesion. The recurrent shoulder dislocation associated with. Uh, uh, labral tear and uh, hill sex lesion, also glenoid bony bankard. Now we come to the muscle. There are important structure of the shoulder. We have uh, my previous speaker told about largely about the rotator cuff muscle. How we diagnose it? This is you can see this is coronal oblique view. This is supraspinatus muscle bulk. Good amount of muscle there. And in this figure. You can see that the muscle is atrophy, it is fibrillated, that is um, petty infiltration there. So in this case, it's when muscle is normal, we can see, we can uh, say it is gutulier type 1 muscle, gutulier 1, gutulier 2, gutulier 3 and gutulier 4 type of muscle, petty infiltration occur. So only uh, type 3 and no uh, surgery can be done only one, two, three. One, two surgery, three and four. No, which should be gone on palliative measure. No conservative measure, no surgery. And in this, you can see that is supraspinatus uh, muscle tear. That is, this is view is sagittal oblique view. This is supraspinatus. This must be infraspinatus. Infraspinatus tendon is okay. This is teres minor. This is subscapular is some sort of. Edema there, it is supraspinatus tendon tear. This is sagittal oblique, and this is coronal oblique. If you, you can see that is y coronal oblique, deltoid muscle here, and this is a glenoid and supraspinatus muscle. This is the whole muscle tendon tear, and it is retracted up to the glenoid. So, muscle is you can see some change of petty infiltration, muscle and retracted, and this indicates it is a massive tear with retraction, with petty infiltration. So uh, there is patient come to us, that is dead arm syndrome, and unable to raise his arm. And this type of, I think it is a type four, uh, gutulier type muscle, and this massive tear. And this is, this is a sagittal tendon. So this is coronal oblique and sagittal plan, we can see it. And supraspinatus, Partial tear, we can see this is, is a coronal oblique view. That is, uh, partial side, there is high signal intensity or some sort of edema. But in case of articular side, it is intact. So we can see partial sided supraspinatus tear. Uh, in this case, in this slide, you can see that is uh, articular side edema, high signal intensity, but the partial side tendon is intact. So it is a articular sided tear of supraspinatus. We can also call it pasta lesion. That is, Partial articular sided supraspinatus tendon avulsion. And in this uh, lower slide, you can see there is uh, articular side tendon intake and bursal side tendon intake. But within the substance of the tendon, there is high signal intensity, that is interstitial tear. So we call it interstitial, or it may be edema or inflammatory stage, or it may be tendinopathy. And then in press this is axial cut, this is supraspinatus tendon, it is in press whole muscle uh, petty infiltration due to the tendon tear. You can see coronal oblique, it is supraspinatus tendon, it is in press spinatus, this is in press tendon tear, this is trapezius muscle, you can see. This is coronal oblique posterior cut, posterior cut, you can see, that is in press muscle tendon tear. So, complete tear with petty infiltration. It is conic uh, tear. You can see there is teres uh, minor muscle. Uh, this is axial cut. 
this is anterior, this is posterior, and this is uh, supraspinatus, mm -hmm. this is infraspinatus, this is teres minor, it is posterior, more posteriorly inserted teres minor muscle, it is high signal implicit tear, and in this case, sagittal, that is a tear. This is supraspinatus, infraspinatus muscle, and this is teres minor muscle tear. And now we come the very important, which is the called um, pain generator of the shoulder, that is uh, biceps tendon. You can see that is, uh, sorry, subscapularis muscle with dislodging of the tendon. And in the, the subscapularis tendon, which this is biceps tendon, but that is bicipital group here. So when there is tear of the subscapularis muscle, it is associated with sometimes uh, dislocation of the bicep tendon. You can see that it means uh, dislocating bicep tendon, subscapularis tendon, and this is subscapularis muscle. And this is the tear of the subscapularis tendon, the axial cut, this is by uh, bicipital group, the anterior part associated with uh, this uh, ligament inferior. And in this view, you can also see that in subscapularis tear muscle. But it is there. In our perspective, subscapular tear there. So bicep tendon. Uh, in this way, this is bicep. It is thickened, irregular, high signal intensity, and inflamed, irregular. Uh, also, this is due to biceps and biceps. It is bicep tendon, bicep tendonitis, bicep tendonopathy. We may say. This is common MRI. You can see that is dark globular in all sequence of pulse sequences or for all MRI card section, you can see that is dark globular in apparent in the supraspinatus uh, insertion. No hesitation, you call it this specific tendinitis of this person. So in my conclusion, uh, I come to that pain radiographs are useful as an initial screening test of the patient with shoulder pain. Ultrasonography may be used for diagnosis of rotator cuff disease. CT useful in case of trauma and to detect associated bony abnormalities. MRI is the modality of choice for most of the shoulder pathologies. MR and CT arthrography is required for investigating instability. And thanks for attention. So my uh, presentation is uh, next our presentation uh, presenter is Dr. Puridudin. His presentation is uh, MRI of the knee. Now I stop my screen. Please, Dr. Purid, share your screen. Assalamu alaikum. Is it visible? Yes. Yes. Uh, visible, visible, sir. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So very good evening, and thank you, GM Zangir Bhai, for nicely presented the complex things. Really, it requires much more time to present as because there are a lot of structures. So I am going to uh, talk a little about the knee MRI. Uh, basically, in everyday practice, all orthopedic surgeon faces the knee injury cases, and many cases requires MRI imaging. But unfortunately, there is a lot of confusion regarding the interpretation of MRI. So uh, what I like that each and every orthopedic surgeon should have a little knowledge to read the MRI fields of me so that we cannot solely depend on the radiologist for the course. If you see the MRI, usually MRI comes with these types of fields and also the coronal sections. So before in, uh, Interpreting the MRI, we should know something about the section characteristics. 
that means which one is the anterior part of the uh, mri which is posterior part which is lateral and which is medial this orientation of the films uh, we must know before the interpretation if we see these two uh, uh, films here in the first film we see anterior and posterior so first we will determine which one so which side is anterior and which side is posterior you see femur is always protruded posteriorly here and here so there is when there is protrusion posteriorly that is the posterior side this one is the posterior side this one is the posterior side and opposite side is anterior so this one is anterior this one is anterior in some cases we can see the patella then it uh, solves the confusion of anterior posterior as because patella is always in anterior lies anterior now we can uh, we, we like to decide that which one is the lateral section and which is the medial section this is the sagittal section this sagitt in this sagittal section this is the tibia you see this is the tibia when shape of the tibia is the champagne glass shape this is this card is for the medial portion medial tibial uh, plateau showing this one and when you see this the tibial card is like the parotid pachit toter moto jokhon dekha jabe this is the parotid shape and this is this section is for the uh, lateral portion of the Uh, tibia so anterior posterior and lateral posterior uh, lateral medial orientation we can solve very easily now if you like to uh, if you can talk uh, regarding the normal acl and pcl the first figure you see this is the acl anterior cruciate ligament i'll talk much on the acl as because this is the commonest injury in the knee so acl usually ascends from the tibia to femur approximately 45 degree upwards and there is no in interruption in the signal it attached to the bone in the tibia sorry and it is attached in the femur so and the thickness is also uh, uh, important i cannot hear sorry i think for it by wifi connection is something is net connection sorry sir amra shunte pacchi na this connection is Can I help, please? Sir, it is too much. No, for this time, no, I have no problem. Okay, no problem. Do you need to look? Yeah. Can I help, please? Sir, देखते কর্নাল অবলিক কার্ড আর হলো এক্সিয়াল কার্ড এখন ওদের যে কর্নাল অবলিক অবলিকে আমরা দেখব যে এটা ল্যাব্রামটা সুপিরিয়র দি অলওয়েজ 
labram ka triangular thakbe eta apparent superior and inferior labram in coronal oblique view and it is low signal intensity नेटवर्क समस्या so uh, i have told about the normal acl now i am telling about the normal pcl so you see uh, pcl and acl thickness is almost same but it is shape, it's a oblique shape it uh, descends from the uh, posterior aspect of the femur to the uh, posterior slope of the tibia so this is the normal pcl now i'll talk a little about the injury of pcl so uh, injury of acl has many features but primary feature of acl injury is the non visualization of acl i have shown you that the acl starts from here and goes upwards like this but in this section we don't see any part of the acl uh, this is the non visualization here we don't see also pcl so this is a case of acl injury and non visualization of acl in none of the sequence is the primary sign of the acl injury and there are some secondary signs of acl injury was that that is the tenting of pcl in the lower panel yeah. in the lower figure you can see that normal configuration of the pcl but in the upper figure that oh, you can see that there is a uh, obliquity is much more pronounced and there is tenting of the pcl and this is the secondary sign for of another secondary sign of acl injury so another important uh, sign is the focal interruption you can see this this part of acl is visible and after that there is a interruption signal is interrupted it is not uh, uh, ascending up to this so focal interruption is an important sign of the acl injury and another important sign is the angulation or non linearity i have uh, shown that acl ascends almost straight 45 degree upwards but here you see the axis is uh, 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 not straight so it is fallen down axis or non linearity so this is another important sign of uh, injury of acl in mri and sometimes there is a uh, there is avulsion of the acl from the uh, femur prox uh, proximally and the uh, you can see the acl in the tibial part attached with the tibia but axis is fallen it is flattened that means it ascend usually 45 degree upwards but here you see it is almost fallen to the 15 to 20 degree sometimes there is a disruption of intrasubstance of acl there is a acl signal but it is altered and there is interruption of the signal intrasubstance tear this type of injury is called the intrasubstance tear of acl another important sign is the bone contusion when there is a acl injury it doesn't happen alone there is a, uh, a much pressure on the bone and when bone is pressurized there is a inside the bone there is edema so this is the almost normal there are some also in the femur zones 
are the edema, but in tibia we can see that there is a significant uh, edema. This uh, high signal intensity, that means whitishness in the bone is, indicates the uh, bony condition and edema. It's the secondary sign of ACL injury. What it could be, you see, the whole ACL signal is uh, widened and it is high intensity. That means it become whitish from the uh, blackish one. So this widen with mixed signal intensity with high signal intensity, that means whitishness. And this is the important uh, findings. And this is a diagnosis of this type of uh, uh, case is the mucoid degeneration of the ACL. Now I'll say something about the PCL injury. This is the normal PCL, that's because when you know the normal, then it is very easier to diagnose the abnormal on. So it, uh, uh, the shape, normal typical shape, you can see the upper figure. And the lower figure, you can see that the, it is attached to the tibia. Tibial attachment is okay, but signal is interrupted. It is not attached to the femur. So this portion is okay, but upper portion, that is femoral portion of this uh, PCL is torn. Another findings uh, of PCL injury, you see there are uh, medial intensity and mostly they are high signal intensity. It becomes whitish from the uh, usual back signal and, and the signal is inhomogeneous. This is also intersubstance here of PCL. So uh, now uh, something about the meniscus injury. So before going to abnormal meniscus, we, we, we uh, like to know the normal meniscus uh, uh, configuration. And you can see here, this is upper femur, uh, this is femur, it is protruded posteriorly. So this is posterior part of the meniscus uh, and this is anterior. So this is the anterior part of the meniscus. And this is tibia and cut section of this tibia is the champagne glass shape. So this is the this is the medial section of the medial meniscus. This is anterior horn. This is posterior horn. And in the cut, you see it almost look like boot eye appearance. At the boot eye appearance, you can see in the lower uh, uh, panel. So this is the uh, this is triangular and this triangular homogeneous and homogeneously usually low signal intensity that means black and looks like bow tie this is the normal meniscus uh, architecture and there are many patterns of injury of meniscus you can see the normal uh, this is also tibia shows the tibia shows the um, champagne glass appearance so this is for the medial meniscus. This is femur posteriorly. So this is posterior horn. This is anterior horn of medial meniscus. And there is injury, different. So it's a complex pattern of injury in case of uh, medial meniscus posterior horn. And same thing here, the lower uh, picture, there is a um, champagne glass appearance of the tibia. Anterior horn is okay, but the posterior horn you see there is a horizontal uh, line which extends inside the medial meniscus posterior horn. So this is the horizontal type of tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And this is a distinct type of injury, you see. Again, this is the tibia showing the uh, champagne glass appearance. This is the, uh, uh, the posterior and this is anterior. You see the anterior horn of the medial meniscus is okay, but in the posterior horn, there is a high signal intensity that means whitish zone. This high signal intensity in the posterior zone, but it does not have correspond or communicate with the upper or lower or any other surfaces. That means this injury is the intrasubstance. And this type of injury, there is pain in the patient, but in arthroscopy, it looks absolutely normal. So it's a very distinct type of injury. Arthroscopic surgeon must know before going to operation else because uh, he'll see the normal meniscus, but post-operatively patient may have some sort of pain. 
and this is another distinct finding is the double BCL sign. You see the one BCL and it seems to be another BCL though it is not BCL and this distinct double BCL sign is uh, positive in case of bucket handle tear of medial meniscus. In case of lateral meniscus injury, bucket handle, there may be double ACL sign, but it is uh, very, very rare. So uh, this is all about the meniscus injury. Now we can uh, evaluate some uh, film, how to uh, read the picture. You see, these are the section. In the first film, this is the, these are the section. So it will start uh, and the tibia, tibia in initial section, it shows the uh, champagne glass shape. So this is posterior, this is anterior, this is anterior horn, this is posterior horn. As, as because the tibia, the champagne glass shape. So this is a, a meniscus, anterior horn, posterior horn, both are okay. In this also okay. Here, okay, here. But you see, uh, this is the PCL, and the PCL, please follow the uh, arrow, otherwise you cannot uh, understand. So this is the PCL. This is the PCL, but it is not the normal anatomy. It is not almost uh, 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 typical oblique. It, there is tenting of uh, PCL. And there is here, we should see the ACL signal, but none of the film shows the ACL. So this up to this this is the uh, uh, that indicates the acl injury and you see this is the parotid size of the uh, shape of the tibia this parotid shape and there is a white interruption in the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus so there is also injury to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus so this is the first film if you see the second film again we should follow this is the tibia and this is the champagne glass shape show this section up for the medial meniscus. So this is posterior horn, this is anterior horn, posterior, anterior horn, posterior horn, but meniscus, medial meniscus looks okay. PCL, uh, is, it shows in the normal uh, uh, anatomy in this PCL. ACL part is in the proximal, tibial part seen, tibial part seen, and, 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 and you see here there is gap, but here there is no gap but the thickness of the normal ACL is not seen here. This film shows ACL extends from tibia to femur, but signal is not as uh, thick as usual. So that indicates the uh, partial tear of the ACL. And the, uh, both, horn, both menisci in this film is normal. So in the second film, there is only uh, there is injury to the uh, partial injury to the anterior cruciate ligament. Here again, is, uh, the section starts from the medial side as because this is the tibia having the uh, um, champagne glass appearance, anterior horn, posterior horn, this is the patella, this is the uh, meniscus are normal, PCL is uh, normal, ACL just uh, final first portion seen, second portion seen, but signal is not as normal as uh, uh, should be. So this is another also uh, case of uh, partial tear of ACL. And this is the second MRI. Uh, we can see that the PCL is normal, PCL normal, PCL normal, ACL only visible here. This is also some visibility here. This is also this is a partial injury of ACL. Now a little uh, overview of the collaterals. That you see that this is the medial collateral, the yellowish one, in the MRI. Usually in the uh, coronal section, we uh, search for the injuries of medial collateral. So it starts from the medial uh, uh, epicondyle of the femur, extends uh, to the uh, face and serenus zone, and and this is the normal medial collateral ligament. But here you see is this early portion seen, but from here to here the signal is interrupted. Signal is interrupted here. So this is the medial collateral injury. And uh, normal uh, lateral collateral ligament in the lower picture, you see the white, uh, yellow arrow, it starts from the head of the fibula, extends to the lateral epicondyle of the femur. Uh, and it is the normal homogeneous uh, black, 
that means low signal intensity. But you see here, this is the injured uh, lateral collateral ligament. Uh, yes, uh, lateral collateral ligament. So another important distinct findings is the meniscal cyst is positive sometimes. And you see this is the medial meniscus, this is the coronal section, medial meniscus, and there is a horizontal tear of the medial meniscus. And medial meniscal cyst usually present in the medial meniscus and mostly associated with the horizontal tear of the uh, meniscus. And this is also medial meniscus, this is also medial meniscus. Uh, and medial meniscal cyst. It is posteriorly seen medially. And this is the Baker cyst. You see the big uh, uh, yeah, water filled sac posteriorly. And you can get some little ideas of osteo osteoarthritis from the uh, MRI also. There's irregularity of the articular surface. In the lower panel, lower figure, you can see the irregularity of the articular surface. There may be some degree of edema, and there may be some uh, degenerative changes in the menisci. And lastly, I'll show some, uh, some anatomical important structure. This is the patellar uh, tendon. Patellar ligament starts from the lower pole of the patella up to the tibial plateau, tibial tuberosity. And above the upper pole of the patella, this is the quadriceps tendon. So this is the two important structures. And this is the iliotibial band. Sometimes it become confusion, become confusion with the lateral collateral ligament. You see, it uh, uh, ascends and go away from the femur. But in case of lateral collateral, it ascends and attaches to the femur. That's the difference. So this is the iliotibial uh, band. And that much about my discussion. Everybody, thanks for sharing. I'll request everybody to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he can release us this size of green environment soon. Thank you again. Thank you very much. For your excellent presentation. Uh, our next presentation, Dr. Javed Jahan Gutwin. Please put it new to the skin. Yeah, yeah. Let me... Uh, Uh, am I already uh, stopped? Uh, stop. So, Tuhin can. Is Dr. Tuhin. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Share your skin. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. You can visible and audible. Please uh, slide show. Slide show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnson and Johnson and the arthroscopic legions from our country to give this opportunity. I welcome you to everybody's today's presentation and this webinar. I'm going to talk about one of the less understood problem in our orthopedics, this is the patellar instability. We call it black hole of orthopedics as because still we are not so understand this difficult problem. So this type patient can present you like acute traumatic dislocation, chronic pathology. Hypergenic problem may arise after the previous surgery, which is usually the medial laxity, and some are habitual dislocation. But according to Bizu, according to Bizu. He classified the patellar instability as a major patellar instability, 
objective petal line instability and potential potential petal line instability on documented dislocation anatomical abnormality and radiographic abnormality so come to the first scenario there is a 22 years male who traffic accident right knee trauma no other assisted injury the patient is hemodynamically stable and how do you proceed we proceed with history taking details examination and radiographic imaging so here you see a clinical you see sorry tohin bhai presenter view theke ber hoye full screen view te jete bhalo hobe okay 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 Hello. There's some problem in. I I just close the program and restart again. Okay. I guess I will stop. Okay. Share I'll, again. We need to share. I'll share my screen again. हेलो আবার নতুন করে শেয়ার করতে হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ এখন হ্যাঁ শেয়ার করো না এখন কি দেখতে পাচ্ছেন হ্যাঁ এখন ওই যে ফুল স্ক্রিন ভিউতে যান নিচে ওই যে হ্যাঁ জি আসছে এখন দেখাচ্ছে এখন যা আসছে জি ফুল স্ক্রিন ভিউ আসছে ওকে আসছে 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 হ্যাঁ the clinically is not working sorry so diagnosis is acute patellar dislocation and what is now the algorithm show most of the acute patellar dislocation is treated with stabilizer until otherwise imaging show there is a osteochondral fragment if there is a osteochondral fragment we have to go for either fix it if it is fixable or we have to repair the medial patellofemoral ligament until otherwise there is a no other associated risk factor so initial treatment for first time dislocation is conservative conservative so what are the conservative treatment to do the reduction and rehabilitation what are the and what about immobilization there is a lots lots of study is to shown that there is no advantage of immobilization for long period so consensus in the period of immobilization you can put a patellar yeah. brace and you just uh, do gentle quadriceps exercise and knee movement start it and particularly concentration should be given to the jodi tohil ekta kache theke bolo bhalo shona jacche na okay 
So moves on chain acts much better than open chain. You see here, this is open chain when the there is a foot is off the ground. This is open chain. When foot is on the ground, this is closed chain, and the joint is at that time joint is bearing weight, so there is a some conditioning of the joint and it's much better. So there are the various types of VMO strengthening exercise. This causes and stabilizes the patella to its position and also it decreases the swelling. So when there is a stricondal fragment, you have to go for fixation. Either it's, if it is fixable or you have to repair or reconstruct the medial patellofemoral ligament. So at, at first you have to go for evacuate the hematoma and you have to look for where is the osteochondral fragment? Sometimes it is within the is large joint cavity, it's very difficult to find it out. So you, you have to search everywhere and retrieve this osteochondral fragment. In this uh, patient, it was under the posterior one of the medial meniscus, and we have to retrieve it. So you see the anatomy of medial patel femoral ligament. This hair, this is the medial patellofemoral ligament, medial patellomeniscal ligament, and medial patellotibial ligament. These all are medial restraint which keep the patella from dislocating laterally. The hair is the femoral attachment. It is just in front of the adaptive tubercle and goes above and posterior to the medial epicondyle. So, Usually the gracilis is the graft of choice and you double fold the gra gracilis and this is the femoral fixation side and this is the patellar fixation side. This is the shortal point, what is we call shortal point. Just a, we can draw a, a posterior line from here, there is a two line one and line two along the domain side line. And here is the total point. And this is the patellar, it is the lower margin of the patellar. This is the patellar articular surface. This just above, upper third is the choice of your fixation. So, graft it passage and finally secure it. In the six month follow up, patient can squat and Body mail, knee pain, PBS, also called instability. And also, this is the patella alta, trochlear dysplasia, dysplasia of the lateral femoral condyle, defective lateral trochlear margin, shallow trochlear group, bustus medialis, medial obliquus insufficiency, and tight lateral structure that is lateral retinochromin in UTBL band. And you must not forget about the PBS surgery and also we forget about the torsional problem like increased femoral antibarsion and the external tibial torsion. So in general, there is an anterior knee pain. There might be episode of collapsing or shifting, giving away, and history of acute trauma. And specifically, we have to sort out the what are the traumatic events. Is there any prior surgery? Is there family history of any leg like before? So, what are the key exam? 
standing gate, standing alignment gate, as there is any J sign, and we should look for Byton S2, whether it is more than five or not. Tenderness of the medial margin will give a clue to the medial patellofemoral ligament tear. And we have to show, we have to see the patellar tracking and patellar grind test where there is any chondromalacia or articular cartilage. And now come to the measurement and we have to look for Q angle, patellar apprehension test, patellar grind test, heel test, and we should also look for range of motion, knee joint range of motion and rotational malalignment like increased femoral antibiotic or external tibial torsion. And don't forget about the meniscus and anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament or other ligament injury. So this is the Byton school we all, all, everybody know it. Is there is more than five, then we should think about hyperlingual. So we, are, we all know about Q angle. Uh, the favor of Q angle is fallen out after TTPG index or TTPG posterior cruciate ligament index. So I am not going to explain much this. The one of the important test is moving patellar apprehension test. My video is not working, so I am not unable to. I'm very unable to show me. In moving patellar apprehension test, you have to, in, in extension, you have to dislocate by medial pressure, laterally dislocate it. And when you're flexing, the patella will jump to the its position. And in the second part of the moving patellar apprehension test, the, again, the reverse should be done. The pressure is from the lateral side to the medial, and the patient will be, the apprehension will be relieved. The statistics say this is the most sensitive and specific test for patellar instability. So I can show this is also video for apprehension test and J sign. Now come to the patellar height. One of the important determinants for patellar instability is the patellar height. There is a lots of method to calculate the patellar height. The latter comes the CD index, which is cation decimal index, most commonly used. The if the cut of margin is one point one point three. If there is 1.3, there might be some in coming. So there are also other ratio like Blackburn film, braided and bed chart, but I don't go to this. Now come to the tubal tuberosity offset. It is a radiographic measurement. Initially, it was with uh, CTS. Nowadays, it's or usually done with MRI. Also. So, usually in the CT, it was significant when TTP the distance is more than 20 millimeter. But in MRI, this figure is a bit less. It about plus minus. And another one is patellar tintangle. It usually open medially. When it is open in the lateral, then we think about the tight lateral structure. And when tintangle is more than 15 or 20, around 20, there might need some lateral lengthening, not lateral release now. It is lateral. So the tilt angle, you see there is a more than 15 degree of tilt angle. 
I don't go to this slide as Salka Sangen, Kongwe Sangen. This is a, a fall of favor as because of other parameter has come and it seems this uh, no uh, less clinical significance. So come to the trochlear dysplasia, one of the important determinant for patellar instability. Bizu describe four types of patellar dysplasia, type A, type B, C and D. This is B and D in which there is a supratrochlear aspar or trochleoplasty. So the dislocation subluxation in extension, you think about amputee, FL incompetence, a subluxation or dislocation is between zero to 30 degree, there might be patella alta, lateral structure, amputee FL incompetence. If this 30 to 60 degree, cochlear dysplasia, patella dysplasia, and bustus medial is incompetence. So this is the flow chart for recurrent patella instability. If there is lateralized tuber tubercle, TTTG index is more than 20 or TTCA index is 22 millimeter, think about tuber tuberosity transfer. Usually nowadays it is done in the distal and medialization. If there is patella alta, you have to Go for tibial tuberosity osteotomy in the form of either feathered or a step cut. When there is a lateral patellar tilt and patellar tibial angle is more than 20, lateral retinacular lensing is the treatment of choice. When there is a no gross normalities, one important, the most important is the patellar ligament reconstruction. If there is a no bulgum, Distal femur osteotomy along with medial patellar ligament reconstruction. In trochlear dysplasia, in A or C, think about medial patellar ligament reconstruction or tubal tuberosity osteotomy is indicated. In visual type B and D, think about sulcus deepening trochlear plasma. And if there is a rotational problem like increased femoral antiversion, you might need tumoral derotation osteotomy. So you had one of the case in where we did a antero medialization and distalization of the tuber tuberosical and it sticks with the cortical screw. So grossly you can just uh, summarize it as a proximal malalignment and distal malalignment and a do accordingly. In the third scenario, you can, in each bending patient experience subluxation or dislocation, which is called habitual dislocation. In habitual dislocation, in every flexion extension, the patellized subluxation or dislocate. So it was a very earlier patient in which we have done medial lateral release and medial reefing, though nowadays there is a strongly discouraged about lateral, isolated lateral release, there is a no role of lateral release. If you go for laterally anything, you should go for lateral retinacular lengthening. So my take home message, identify and categorize whether acute, chronic, major, or habitual, and whether it any previous surgery or not. And workup show thorough physical examination, imaging, TTG ratio, CD ratio, CD distance, and patellar tilt and trochlear dysplasia. Do judicial surgery and don't forget about non-operative management. Thank you very much. At last, I just to say one thing, one of our beloved Professor Shomirul Islam sir is in very critical condition still now. I humble request to pray for him, for every orthopedic surgeon around the Bangladesh. Please pray, pray for him. Thank you very much.
たのでございます。Thank you.、Uh, thanks, all the s p e a k e r for their excellent preparation.、Uh, I will discuss ins and outs of the meniscus.、Uh, actually, uh, today's topics, the we, we two, I and Dr. Hai, will present more about the meniscus. I basically will discuss more on the basic anatomy and biomechanics of the Meniscus. Everything has a history. How? What was the, the primitive picture of the、uh, meniscus? You can see this one. It was, there was a first insertion. There's only one insertion of the tarsus. The, the, this is the meniscus of the,、uh, this is lateral meniscus, and this is the lateral meniscus of the chimpanzee. And it is circular in shape. But The human, the lateral meniscus, has two parts two insertions, this anterior insertion and the posterior insertion. So、uh, it is crescent shape. The lateral meniscus of the human is crescent shape and it has two insertions. But initially, it was in tarsus, it was one insertion. There are two concepts the old concept, and we are now thinking about the new concept. The old concept. It, it is thought to be a vestigial organ. And if it is injured, okay, distract it, remove it. That is the old concept that remains con considered on meniscectomy. But what is the new concept? The new concept is depends, repair of the meniscectomy. Now it is called safe meniscus. So everything, what we think about the meniscus is safe meniscus. That is repair or reconstruct. The meniscus, not meniscectomy. These are some common s c e n e This is taken from the videos,、uh, seen above the sports injury. So, knee is very frequently injured during sports and it also bears all weight. Now comes what is the morphology of the meniscus? We have to know. If we go in details about the meniscus, we should know about the morphology. There are two types there's median meniscus. And the lateral meniscus. The median meniscus is the crescent shape, and the lateral meniscus is more. This is this is the sorry. This is the median meniscus, that is a crescent shape, and this is lateral C shape. Anatomy of the meniscal ligament. We know there are anterior intermeniscal ligament. Menisco femoral ligament. There are two types of menisco femoral ligament. One is anterior menisco femoral ligament, and another is posterior menisco femoral ligament. This menisco femoral ligament is、uh, surrounding the posterior cruciate ligament. There are other ligaments like collateral ligament. It has two parts superficial collateral and the deep collateral, medial collateral ligament. But the The deep medial collateral ligament is attached with the medial meniscus. This is once again, we are、uh, giving the lateral view of the uh, uh, menisco femoral ligament. This is,、uh, anter uh, this is anterior、uh, uh, menisco femoral ligament. This is PCL. This is posterior menisco femoral ligament. This anterior menisco femoral ligament is also called ligament of Humphrey. And Posterior menisco femoral ligament, which is also called ligament of Riesberg.、Uh, blood supply. The blood supply, uh, this uh, meniscus is not totally、uh, supplied the blood. Only in case of medial meniscus, only 30% is vascularized. And lateral meniscus is less vascular than the medial meniscus, and it is about 10 to 25% is vascularized. So, when going for repair, we should know、uh, which part of the meniscus will repair and which is, the, which is more vascular. That is, the outside, outer one, that is red zone, is most vascular. And if we repair that part, it will heal easily. 
So there are small synovial fringe of two to three millimeter extending over the peripheral rim. It doesn't contribute the blood supply. There is another part of, uh, of the popliteus hiatal hy region in the posterolateral meniscus area. It is also not very much supplied with the blood. This is the picture we'll see. There are two parts, this peripheral part, that is peripheral capsule. It is attached with that mostly capsule and it is highly uh, um, supplied by the blood. And it is also called the red zone. The inner part is a white zone. That is mostly it is not vascularized. But intermediate zone, which is also called red, red and white zone, that is intermediate supply. Some supply is present and mostly not present. Peripheral vascular penetration. You have, to, we have to know the how the peripheral. We know that peripheral part is vascular, and it is enters into the inner part through vascularized channel. So, from the peripheral vascular part, it penetrates inner part, but innermost part is not vascular. So, uh, you can see that lateral meniscus, the peripheral part is a vascular and it penetrates inside inside and it is less vascularized same case of the uh, median meniscus in peripheral part is 30 percent vascular mostly 30 percent and inner part is not that much vascular so if we do meniscectomy we will do non-vascular part part again i am concentrating on the Three part, these zones, we have to remember red zone, red white zone, and white zone. Red zone is vascularized, red white zone, intermediate part, that is intermediate red white zone, and white zone is non vascular part. We have to know another uh, thing that connecting lesion in the vascular portion, that is, if, if there is uh, injury here, then there is an connective portion here from periphery through this connective portion this portion is healed if we could repair this uh, this part injury this meniscal injury then from periphery to up to this part through the connective vascularized way this this injury can be repaired so this is a concept that is the connecting a lesion in the avascular portion of the meniscus with the peripheral blood flow through use of a vascular access channel. That means there is a vascular access channel is present. Now comes histology. We have to know the structure, how the meniscus is uh, uh, consist. That is about 60 to 75% of the meniscus is formed by water. And 22% of meniscus is collagen. That is about, see, and 28, about 88%, it is formed by water and collagen. And 0.8% is about glycosaminoglycan, and 0.12% is formed by the DNA. This, the, the collagen is formed by interesting network, and there is of course, presence of some fibrochondrocytes in between there. You can see the fibrochondrocyte cells. And there are some extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix in, in it. Okay. 90% of the collagen is type 1 collagen. And it is circumferentially arranged fibrin. And there are some radial tie rod. You can see this is this is radial tie rod. So mostly uh, circumferential fiber. That is, it is type one collagen, and it is arranged by circumferential way. And there are some radial tie rods are present. You can see the random. These are the collagen fibrillar network on the uh, on the surface and. This is circumferential collagen fiber. You can see bundle. 
okay Now comes what is the function of the meniscus it reduce reduce the contact stresses it spread the load when there is load is come it spread the load it, it is said that it absorb the shock it gives the stability we know the one of the main function of the meniscus is give the stability and it also increases lubrication lubrication how it is because there is synovial fluid and though it increases the surface it also helps to lubricate the joint surface there is presence of proprioceptive receptor in the meniscus so it helps in proprioception also and last not the least is it also gives the nutrition in the joints you can see that this is a joint load and through this it increases the surface and it increases the surface contact area so if it, since it is increases the surface contact area it reduces the stress in the joint so it helps to reduce the development of the osteoarthritis shock absorber it is uh, there is compressive modules there is equilibrium and fluid film lubrication also contributes to the shock absorption it increases the stability of the joint as per gupta et al uh, uh, the posterior horn of the meniscus stabilizes the anterior drawer in the acl deficient knee that means the uh, posterior horn of the meniscus is gives stability it gives the stability of which patient the the patient who have deficient of the acl and in menisco femoral uh, ligament is a secondary restraint to the posterior drawer that is acl is the primary resistant and menisco femoral ligament is the secondary restriction it also increases the rotationally rotational stability it also increases the rotational stability so during uh, rotation the you can see the meniscus draw posteriorly this is initial initial position during rotation it draws posteriorly so it 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 has an specially motion and helps to posterior translation of the uh, lateral meniscus so ro rolling and gliding motion it helps to increases the rolling and glided that means in deep flexion this meniscus rolled posteriorly and gives helps to more flexion so you can see another picture this is initial picture and when knee flexes it goes behind and helps in flexion and due to uh, due to goes posteriorly in deep flexion it helps to reduce the pressure which would give in during deflection lubrication and and nutrition it gives lubricate the knee because articular cartilage has many mode of lubrication that is when the synovial fluid you can see the synovial fluid due to structure this is below is articular cartilage due to the synovial fluid since it is increases the surface area so during rolling of the synovial fluid it gives lubrication and we know the uh, that it also gives some nutrition it's some nutrition proprioception there are some mechano receptor in the insertional attachment and there are some raffini nerve endings and persinian corpuscles present in the, the meniscus which gives proprioception and if there is so before doing to meniscectomy we should think that it will reduce the proprioception thus it will reduce the uh, neuro proprioception of the knee, knee joint so before we should be very careful doing the meniscectomy there are different types of meniscal meniscal tear there are medial meniscus tear mostly at 60% of the meniscal tear occurs in the medial meniscus 
and 40% of the meniscal tear in the lateral meniscus. Why the meniscal tear occurs more in the menis median meniscus? Because, because the median meniscus is attached with the medial collateral ligament. So it cannot move. So mostly when the internal rotation occurs, the median meniscus injuries more. The lateral meniscus is free with the lateral collateral ligament. That's why it, it, it is not more like the median meniscus, the injury occurs. The mostly, if you consider the total area, anterior, middle, or posterior zone, mostly injury occurs in the post, middle and posterior part of the meniscus. The very rarely, anterior part of the meniscus got injured. So tear occurs mostly in the medial meniscus and tear occurs mostly posterior and the middle part of the meniscus. Natural history of the meniscal tear. What happened if the meniscal is tear? If the meniscus is removed, the degeneration will occur early. That's why nowadays they want to repair the meniscus. So early onset of osteoarthritis will, de will develop if the meniscus is removed. But there are questions. If the, if the meniscus is left untreated, what will happen? Definitely, there are some symptoms. The most important symptoms and sign is locking. It is very much a problem to the patient when the locking occurs. And there are also other symptoms occur like effusion. And if, if it is not treated meniscal injury, then the quality of life will be compromised. Now, since we have done a lot of meniscectomy, those we those our in country, we mostly we are, we are uh, habituated with uh, SCL reconstruction and some type of meniscectomy we have done. But now we have to end this uh, doing meniscectomy. Now we have to go save the meniscus and. The meniscal repair we have to will have to done. So, uh, wh what is the consequence of the meniscectomy? The lateral meniscectomy result in osteoarthritis. I have already told that lateral meniscus, if it is meniscectomy is done, there definitely the osteoarthritis will develop, and also medial meniscus. If you do meniscectomy, of course, and the PR Allen, R. A. Denham. And JBGS in 1984, that means it is about 40 years, uh, about 40 years back. And uh, they had told that the, uh, the meniscectomy, the consequence of the meniscectomy is the development of early osteoarthritis. So, there are three types of change. The of the ridge, formation of the ridge, this is formation of the ridge, type two, flattening of the femoral condyle, and type three, the narrowing of the joint. So all are uh, the consequence of the meniscectomy, which causes osteoarthritis, only osteoarthritis. You can see some uh, natural, uh, some arthroscopic uh, picture, development of, uh, that is degeneration, okay? There's some degenerative, this is arthroscopy meniscectomy done. This early degeneration is developing. So, and this is all the, the pictures I've taken. Uh, there's early degeneration sign is, that is after meniscectomy. This is altered surface. You can see the changes of the degenerative uh, changes in the knee joint. So there are other factors uh, 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 which also causes osteoarthritis after meniscectomy. That, that means after doing meniscectomy, the limb alignment is changed. Uh, if there is presence of associated injuries like medial or lateral collateral ligament, there will be a definitely degenerative changes will occur. If the age is more, if the activity level is more, if the previous history of knee surgery all causes degenerative changes, which also associated with the meniscectomy. 
Now comes same meniscus. This is our philosophy. The main topic is we have to go for repairing the meniscus. Uh, there are other, uh, other options of uh, treating the meniscus that meniscus transplant is doing in developed countries. There are meniscus scaffold present and meniscal replacement, artificial meniscus replacement also occurring in developed countries. This is repair. There are three types of techniques, inside out, outside, inside, in, and all inside technique of the meniscal repair. These are some theoretical pictures. Meniscal transplant is also, um, this is natural. There's a human, uh, human meniscus is transplanting to the other human, and but there is artificial uh, meniscus is also there that has been transplanting now. To only because to reduce the degenerative change and early osteoarthritis. There are some uh, meniscal substitutes also there, collagen, periosteum, in, small intestine and mucosa also uh, giving, but this is our most theoretical for our, our. There are hydrogels, polyurethane is also present. So the summary of my lecture is the meniscus of the knee is a highly complex structure, both anatomically and biomechanically, whose form the intricately linked to the various function. Understanding biomechanics and anatomy is key for management of meniscal injury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arvind Asan, for elaborative description of meniscus. Please and mute. Our next speaker, Dr. Mohammad Abdul Hai, we will talk on meniscal injury and repair. Please, Dr. Abdul Hai, share your screen and go on and talk. Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yes, audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, the organizer, and welcome you all uh, to my this. A little discussion about the meniscal tear and repair. Thank you, Dr. Parvez Asan, sir, for detailed and elaborative description and uh, detailed talk about the meniscus. Uh, now I am talking about the meniscal tear and repair within short by tidbits. Uh, there is a detailed anatomy was uh, described earlier. Just we have to understand and try to uh, figure out the where the injury is menstrual cushion um, outer red red zone middle red white zone and inner white white zone we most likely to repair within the red red zone and red white zone and uh, in case of white white zone we like to uh, partial meniscectomy or replacement something like that most clinically important features related to our meniscus is lateral meniscus. Uh, this is more mobile structure. And uh, so there is less chance of tear, which is also described earlier. And most uh, <coughs> common injuries occur in the medial meniscus. Lateral meniscus is associated with mostly discoid meniscus and meniscal cyst. Lateral meniscus is also associated with the injury to the ACL. And uh, for medial meniscus, uh, we have discussed earlier more with the degenerative change. And the uh, Becker cysts are more common. We have to uh, do the meniscal repair for the meniscal. Uh, for the load transmission, minimize the contract stress and contribute to the stability and chondro protection. Uh, the few clinical features, usually there is a history of twisting injury and acute knee pain, often severe and slowly onset of uh, swelling within 48 hours. There may be history of locking, uh, uh, though this is the suggestive of the bucket handle tear. There is also a patient may give the history of popping and clicking within the knee joint. 
limited motion of the knee joint and most uh, important clinical features the tenderness when pressing on the meniscus our uh, clinical examinations are uh, depending upon this point uh, commonly, most common uh, test are the McMurray test. Principal is to the trap the meniscus between the tibia and the femur. By uh, trapping, we can uh, uh, find out the uh, which meniscus is easily uh, injured. Patient needs to be relaxed. Uh, then one hand on the knee joint line, other hand to hold the foot and ankle, just like this. Place the knee joint as far as possible, hyperflexion. And for medial meniscus tear, we have to externally rotate. For lateral meniscus, we have to internally rotate the tibia over the uh, uh, femur. And positive McMurray test are clicking or popping felt associated with pain also. Radiographs are uh, usually not uh, helpful. MRI is the most sensitive diagnostic test. MRI grade 3 signal is indicated of a full thickness tear. And meniscal cyst indicates the presence of meniscal tear. In double PCL sign, when we get the double PCL sign, then we can uh, issue about the bucket handle meniscus. The question should every meniscus to be repaired? No. Just appropriate and informed decision is required. Only 20% is repairable. Then uh, we have to uh, avoid the repairing of the chronic complex tear, degenerative tear, and unstable knee. And associated with grade 4 osteochondral defects, we have to avoid the minimal tear. In case of meniscal tear, uh, is over, uh, management is non-operative treatment. Indicative first line of uh, first line of treatment of degenerative tear is non-operative and acute episode without locking, but with acute synovitis. Uh, we should go just like immediate abstinence from the weight bearing, rest, ice pick exclusion over the joint. Compression dressing, NSI, and slowly rehabilitation exercise. Uh, then, for the decision of the meniscal repair versus resection, uh, we usually scoring by the prompt score, prediction uh, of the repairability of the meniscal tear. Here, few points, and we count the points. If the point is four or less, then repair is indicated. Uh, in case of location within the two millimeter of the capsule, the point is zero. Two to three millimeter, one. Just uh, away from the capsule, point is more. And uh, in case of age, there is more the age, the more the point, and uh, less chance of repairability. Size of the injury, less than two centimeter, two to four centimeter, and more than four centimeter. Uh, more the size, more uh, there is less chance of repairability. Tissue quality. And a uh, few qualifiers also here. If the unstable injury, then point is two. Malaline of the knee joint, one. Chondromalacia grade three, one. Radial tear of the meniscus, two. Uh, when ACL reconstruction is done, then the point is minus one. Because that uh, comes from the ACL reconstruction procedure. There is principles of repairs uh, in the first stimulation of the healing potential, then initiation of the defect. So, uh, stimulate the healing potential by perimeniscal synovial abrasion or fibrin cloth placement or uh, abrading the uh, meniscal tear. Then comes to the point of stability to stabilize the incomplete tear, short length tear, and uh, Augmented with the suture approximation, uh, lateral immobilization, and post operative non uh, non weight bearing also needed for the stability. We should approach the meniscal tear like a fracture fixation. 
preparation of tier is essential step consider the tier as a non linear uh and hence the techniques that debridement average and uh trifinet and application of the clot fibrin clot over the injured site reduce the tear accurately this is the prime needed then maintain the reduction throughout the procedure of the fixed replacement otherwise fixation will be failed hybrid techniques are useful especially deformed displaced and bucket handle tears there's hybrid uh, maybe combination of the tear repair accessory portal to improve the access and fi uh, fixation of the configuration accessory portal as much as needed to have to go through and for repair perpendicular placement of the implants with every 5 mm and grab the circumferential fiber bundle uh, when we try to fix or stabilize the fragments to ensure the optimal purchase of the strength and ensure the implants that are not crowded intraarticularly or extraarticularly and avoid stuffing the meniscus with the stress riser inducing implants and individualized rehabilitation also needed there is uh, three types of techniques outside in inside out and all inside and hybrid is combination of the uh, one or two uh, two or more techniques now we a little discussion about the inside out repair it, this is easy to learn and reproduce there is few zone specific cannula there we should uh, use this zone specific cannula to uh, use that needle through this cannula highly recommend the term here figures are showing uh, through the cannula needles are passed to the to uh, both side of the tear then pulling the needle outside and knots Uh, tied outside the joint advantage is high mechanical strength can be get by all in, uh, inside out technique but there is chance of neurovascular injury and need skin incision outside the joint there comes on outside in technique here the uh, we should approach from outside but uh, views from inside suture retriever pass through the meniscal segment uh, suture retriever one side another side van van needle with pds suture passed through the another segment and suture is retrieved through the suture retriever outside the joint and tied like this all is at repair these are all the uh, different uh, so inside repair instruments according to the uh, different companies fast fix 360 for smith nephew omni span for deboy meniscal clinch for arthrex and fire by convent all is said uh, there is advantages quick and easy procedure there is by observable least invasive can be approached to the posterior end without hampering any uh, without hampering a disadvantage is limited compression variable response and foreign body reaction there is uh, implants are brittle got chance of condral uh, instruments there is a great issue of cost and a learning curve we have to learn by taking times to use the all inside repairs rehabilitation is the important portion also for the uh, arthroscopic procedure there is for isolated repair of the meniscus immobilize the knee with full extension for 7 to 10 days and allow non weight bearing with crutches this important point is non weight bearing weight bearing and range of motion about 4 weeks after the surgery with crutches Uh, in case of acl reconstruction knee is immobilized for two weeks in full extension with immediate weight bearing here weight bearing is allowed immediately an active range of motion from 0 to 90 degree of flexion twice daily for 20 minutes can be started immediately post operative after two weeks progressive range of motion by cycling high strengthening exercises are begun 
weight bearing and range of motion should not be done at the same time the weight bearing and range of motion two different thing should not be done in the same time however until about 4 weeks after the surgery it should be started well so the uh, discussion is visualization what spinal needles are the most important points of the meniscal repair and there's thorough site preparation debridement and rasping is prime needed which is the prime needed to prepare the bed for healing otherwise though we repair the meniscus it will not heal as is the geometry of the tear and provisional reduction prior to implant placement then accessory incision and proper retraction placement proper placement is also very much properly select repair devices and method that optimize the tear pattern and rehabilitation also in devices thank you all thanks <coughs> dr abdul rai for your nice presentation you have covered all aspects of the discuss and now we are the uh, behind the scheduled time so now ask question and answer session what about other Hello. Hello. You and Abdul, you stop sharing. Um, my question. I can, can I ask you a question to, to Professor Hassan Mansur? Yes, yes. Please. Yes, thanks. You uh, various aspects of shoulder stitch taking and examination power. Shoulder is a I know there's a complex joint. It includes both right hand humerus joint, scanoclavicular joint, and this is joint as well as um, scapulothoracic joint. Yes. And if you think it is a shoulder complex, the sole of the complex is the scapula. So yes. Say something, something about the scapula. Okay, so uh, for the scapula, uh, you see, uh, I have just discussed about the history taking, uh, not the clinical examination. But uh, in clinical examination, we have to think about scapular dyskinesia, a common problem. And for this scapular dyskinesia, uh, you have to see the patient thoroughly, uh, expose the patient. And for the movement of the scapula, because the, the shoulder joint movement composed of two movements. Uh, one is glenohumeral movement and another is scapular movement. So to see the scapular movement and glenohumeral movement, you have to expose the patient and uh, keep the hand over the shoulder and to examine properly for uh, how much he can uh, do with the glenohumeral joint and how much with the scapular joint. So this is the physical examination. But during shoulder examination, you know, shoulder history taking, you can ask, you may ask, that whether uh, his movement is hello, hello, yes, we can hear him. Yes. Uh, about his, uh, please, unmute others. Please unmute others. Uh, unmute others. Okay, so uh, you can, uh, you may ask the patient about the uh, yeah, shoulder and the back of the uh, shoulder. Okay. Okay, nice. Uh, sir, I'm Dr. Divakar, sir. Yes, Divakar. Amar, sir, 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 Second question, sir, Jehutu Omeniscal uh Amra Minisect to Mamra Pongo Hashpatal normally Minisect to Mikori, Onikula Karone, economical act a caron, uh that for instrumental act a caron, Kintama Postnoch Meniscus, Jokon Amra Minisect to Mikori, second osteoarthritis rector man a rector bear a jai patient. 
তাহলে আমার প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে স্যার এখানে কি আমরা پیشنটদেরকে মেনিসকাস রিপেয়ার না করে ইন্ডিকেটেড ইন্ডিকেশন থাকলেও মেনিসেকটমি করে দিই সেখানে پیشنটদেরকে কোনো হার্ম করছি কিনা پیشنটের ভালো করার জায়গায় ক্ষতি করছি কিনা আর তৃতীয়ত স্যার প্রশ্ন আমার এখানে স্যার আমি আমি পঙ্গুতে পিআরপি নিয়ে কাজ করি স্যার এখানে মেনিসকাস রিপেয়ার অথবা মেনিসেকটমি করা প্লাস এসিএল রিকনস্ট্রাকশন সাথে পিআরপি দেওয়ার কোনো ভূমিকা আছে কিনা স্যার প্লিজ স্যার मोस्टলি प्रथम क्वेश्चन टा उत्तर दीते चाहे दूसरे क्वेश्चन टा एक तो शोभर जन्नू उन मुक्त रखते चाहे बिकॉज़ वो टल ऑर्थो बायोलॉजिक्स सेकंड एक क्वेश्चन टा आपने पीआरपी को वो टल आलादा टॉपिक वो टा उत्तम जे द इंडिकेशन इफ इंडिकेशन इज़ नॉट राइट अमी रिपेयर कर बो डेफिनेटली देर शुड ब फ्लेक्सिबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीबिलिटीब
डुंगेक्ट्रोमी खरच कम लगे रिपेयर इंडिया रुगीरा पागल मत बस 
মানে ইউ সেন্ড দা পারসন ইউ উইল গেট দা পার্সেন্টেজ ইভেন আই টোল ইউ দিস ইজ এ স্টোরি যদি ভারতে গেলেই যে সব অপারেশন করবে এই সব ইন্ডিকেশন আছে নো আই ডোন্ট বিলিভ আমার এই লাস্ট 40 ইয়ার্সের অভিজ্ঞতা হলো অনেক সার্জনরা বসে আছে যেটা তাদের ভাব নাই রোগী আসো দালালি করে যেভাবে হোক নিয়ে আসো কতগুলো হাসপাতাল বসে আছে তারা সবাই শুধু এই ধান্দা এখন কোশ্চেন হচ্ছে যে আমাদের কখন রিপেয়ার করব কখন রিপেয়ার করা দরকার রিপেয়ার করতে হবে এটা ঠিক আই ডু এগ্রি অন দ্যাট মা ইকবাল মোহাম্মদ চৌধুরী বলেছে যে আমাদের শুরু করতে হবে বাট রিমেম্বার দ্যাট আমাদের پیشنট আর লেট কামার দে আর কামিং লেট মোস্ট অফ দ্য কেজেস নাম্বার 1 নাম্বার 2 পয়েন্ট হলো এরা এদের লক নিয়ে আছে কিনা তাদের মানে স্প্রিংগিং হচ্ছে কিনা সেটাও একটা ফ্যাক্টর সেগুলো দেখতে হবে আমরা যেখানে মিনিমাম একটা ধরো গ্রেড 1 গ্রেড খুবই মিনিমাম একটা ইনজুরি সেখানে রিপেয়ার করতে দিয়ে আমরা ইনফেকশন বানাবো আমাদের রোগীদের কিন্তু ফিনান্সিয়ালি উইক তারা गवर्नमेंट হসপিটালে অনেক বেশি চাপ ওই যেখানে আমাদের ফরিদ কাজ করতেছে দিবাকর কাজ করতেছে নিটোরে সেখানে অনেক বেশি চাপ ওটিও পায় না প্রাইভেট সেক্টরে অনেক বেশি চাপ আমার মনে হয় আমাদের জাজমেন্টটা দরকার অপারেশন অবশ্যই শুরু করতে হবে ইউ পিপল শুড স্টার্ট ইট তবে রিমেম্বার দ্যাট ডোন্ট ডু মানে হারি প্লে এটা করতে দিয়ে রোগীদের ক্ষতি হলে ওটাকে আরো আরো রিভার্স মানে আমাদের আরো মানে সেটব্যাকটা খারাপ হবে তাই না সেটব্যাক হবে আমি রিকোয়েস্ট করব সবাইকে বি কেয়ারফুল যে এটা কতটুকু ইনজুরি হয়েছে এমআরআই তো ইউ ক্যান সি এখানে এমআরআই যেভাবে ডেসক্রাইব করা হলো সুন্দরভাবে তো এটা কত কত বড় বটল বাকেল হ্যান্ডেল টিয়া আরো বড় রকমের টিয়া লংগিটিউডিনাল টিয়া সেটা সবাই করে দেন চার্জ ইট আমি দেখাচ্ছি কারণ ইদানিং অনেকে আমরা ফটফট করে অপারেশন করে ফেলি দেন অপারেশনের পরে কিন্তু রেজাল্ট ভালো হয় না এক দুই নম্বর কারণ হলো যে আমাদের কেউ আমরা সার্জারির পরে যে রিহ্যাবিলিটেশন সে কথা বলি না অর্থাৎ এক্সারসাইজ 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 বিল্ড ইওর কোয়ার্ডিসেপস বিল্ড ইওর ইওর হ্যামস্ট্রিং এই কথাটাই বলা হয় না তো রোগীদের যে বলতে হবে যে ইউ ডু এক্সারসাইজ আফটার অল দিস মেনিসেক্টমি অল দিস ক্রুশিয়েট এন্ট্রো ক্রুশিয়েট পোস্টরো ক্রুশিয়েট এইটি একটা যে বিরাট প্রটোকল মেইনটেইন করতে হবে এবং অলমোস্ট 6 মাস 9 মাস 1 বছর 2 বছর সারা জিন্দগি ভরে করতে হবে এইটিও আমি দুঃখের সঙ্গে বলতে হয় অনেকে বলে না এটি হলো আমার রিগার্ডিং মেনিস কাজ পিআরপি নিয়ে আমার কথা লাস্ট ইউ নো আসল আই ওয়াজ ইন আমেরিকান একাডেমি মিটিং ইন লাস্ট লাস্ট ভেগাসে ইন দা লাস্ট লাস্ট ইয়ার তো এবারে তো হলোই না সেখানে এগুলো নিয়ে আমি ডিটেইলস জয়েন করেছিলাম পয়সা দিয়ে 100 ডলার দিয়ে পিআরপি স্টেম সেল অল দিস এখন পর্যন্ত প্রমাণিত হয়নি যে দিস আর অল ওয়ার্কেবল অর ওয়ার্কিং ফর দা বেটার নি অর বেটার এনিওয়্যার তারা বলেছে স্টেম সেল ইন দি ল্যাবরেটরি স্টেম সেল ইন দি ল্যাবরেটরি হয়তো বা স্টেম সেল আসবে এক সময় যে সময় কাটলেস গুলোকে আমরা রিজেনারেট করার মতো করে ক্ষমতা দিতে পারবো বা কাটলেস কে রিপেয়ার করা যাবে अदरवाइज देयर इज नो আল এখন পর্যন্ত কোন রকমের কোন ইনজেকশন ইভেন স্টেরয়েড বলেছে যে অ্যাকুট ক্রাইসিস ছাড়া স্টেরয়েড দেওয়ার কোন দরকার নাই ইট ডাজন্ট ডু এনি হেল্প এটা হলো ইউ নো আমি তোমাকে শেয়ার করেছি আমি যে বেস্ট মিটিং যেটা বলা হয় সমস্ত সার্জেন্টদের বেস্ট বেস্ট মানে পেপার আর্টিকেল সবকিছু মিলে আসলে দেখা যায় এই ছিল আমার কমেন্ট फरीद के बोलो फरीदेशन टाइम से देखा बुढ़ो मानुस देखते तुम तो मान जो काट कर बड़ो एल्लास देखाते मानुष्ट 
তোমরা সবাই খুব ভালো করতেছো ইউ আর ডুইং মার্বেলাস তোমরা কেন ওইভাবে প্রেজেন্ট করো কেস গুলোকে মোবাইলে তুলে রাখো এন্ড দেন প্রেজেন্ট করো সবগুলো কেজি তুমি কেজও দেখাও যে এটা আমার ছিল আমি এটা এই করেছি পরবর্তীতে আমার এই রেজাল্ট দ্যাট উইল বি গুড ইমপ্রেশন যারা আমাদের পার্টিসিপেন্ট আছে एवरीबॉडी উইল বি মানে ভেরি হ্যাপি টু নো দ্যাট দ্য ইউ রেজাল্ট ইজ অলসো ডুইং গুড টু দ্য মুখে বলা না দিস ইজ करेक्ट এন্ড আই নো আই নো ইওর পারফরম্যান্স অল অফ ইউ সো ইউ ডু দ্য গুড থিং ওকে थैंक यू सो मच चेस्टा करडी तैरी बडी थे गाइडलैन जहांगीर <laughs> उद्योगियन देखी मासूद बोलो जहांगीर बोलो परवेज बोलो कैकजन आ देखो तुम्हारे संगे पार्टिसिपेट करते 
আমার অন্যদিকে এত অ্যাটেনশন দিতে হয়েছে আমি মানে এগুলো বলবো কি আর আমি চাই যে তোমরা গ্রো করো ইউ গ্রো 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 দ্যাট ইজ দি ওনলি ওয়ে কোন রাস্তা নাই জাহাঙ্গীর थैंक यू আমি আর বলতে চাই না কিন্তু মাসুদ ভাই আপনি চিন্তা করেন কারণ এবারে বসে থাকলে তবে না আপনি আসলে না না চিন্তা করার সময় আসছে আমাদের আমাদের সাথে কথা বলে তবে স্যার ধন্যবাদ স্যার তবে স্যার আরেকটা আপনাদেরকে আগামী 12 তারিখ শুক্রবার সন্ধ্যা 7টায় ইন্ডিয়ান আর্থোস্কোপি সার্জনের সাথে বাংলাদেশ আর্থোস্কোপি সার্জনের একটা জয়েন্ট মিটিং আছে সবাই পার্টিসিপেট করবেন আর 27 তারিখ এই মাসের সন্ধ্যা 7টায় সার এবং ইন্ডিয়ান আর্থোস্কোপি সোসাইটির মধ্যে আরেকটা এরকম আর্থোস্কোপি সার্জনদের মধ্যে আরেকটা ডিসকাশন মিটিং হবে এই দুই অনুষ্ঠানে সবাইকে আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়ে আজকের মতো এখানে আমরা শেষ করছি ধন্যবাদ ভালো থাকবেন দোয়া করবেন সবাই যেন ভালো থাকে ফজল ভাই ফজল ভাই